Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Following the Way of the Cross broadcast. I am Pastor Byram, and we thank you so much for joining us this Monday morning live. And uh, we are going to be this morning continuing our study uh, with this uh, hyper grace era. I just really felt impressed to the Lord to, to continue in that direction this morning. And uh, But before we do that, I want to introduce my special guest this morning. I've got my wife here, as always. Good morning, everybody. And we've got Brother Mike Warfield with us this morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord. And um, we, uh, before we get into that as well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to make available. And uh, this is the DVD that has just come out on the Hyper Grace era. Uh, we took uh, really... Uh, four of the best episodes that uh, we could and put it in a four DVD set for you and um, these this is the following the way of the cross broadcast where we have discussed this era in great detail I think that we we really covered uh, this uh, this era extensively and this will help you understand and help uh, make you aware of what to look for with this era as it continues to spread unfortunately so uh, get this in your hands for any donation. We will send you a copy of it. Once again, this is a four uh, DVD uh, set series of the Following the Way of the Cross broadcast. And as well, we have the other one that I want to make available to you, which is the danger of false teaching. And uh, get a copy of this one as well. It will help you understand the seriousness of the danger of false teaching. How many know there's a danger to it? That's right. That's and right. Uh, we need to be aware. We need to be educated. We need to understand what the Word of the Lord teaches. And uh, we live in a society today, you guys, where uh, really we are seeing the church being taken a storm by philosophies of man, by psychology methods. We are seeing uh, all these things uh, uh, literally just take place before our very eyes. So it's important that every Christian out there be on their toes as it regards error. So with that, I'm going to ask my wife to pray, and we'll get right into the Word this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord, and thank, thank you, you for the, the time that we can have to be able to have, have fellowship with you, morning, Lord, to learn of you Jesus. yet once again, Lord. We just ask that you would minister to us and through us, that you would penetrate our hearts with your Word that you would correct us, Lord God, that we might think more and more like you. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' in name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And amen. Um, I want to I look at uh, a, a, a scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1 this morning. And, and um, we're going to discuss a little bit about um, how the Apostle Paul... Uh, would show us our depravity before he would show us our position. And um, one of the things that uh, they claim, and Heather, uh, once again, they claim that uh, there's no need to look at our depraved position. Am I correct on that? Yeah, and the thing that I've heard, um, you know, a couple of, one particular proponent of this doctrine is, I've heard him say, um, you know, that God will only correct you based on your position in Christ, not based on your individual acts of sin. Mm -hmm. um, and then he gives a scripture in 1 Corinthians 6 where, uh, you know, he'll say that, you know, God shows you your position in Christ and says that that's the only thing he's going to correct you on. He's never going to bring up individual acts of sin for a believer. Right. That's his argument. And, you know, as I began to look at 1 Corinthians 5 and 1 Corinthians 6, um, I, I wanted to read before as well and after because, you know, this was written as one continual letter. That's so right. you can't just cherry pick scriptures and say, well, this is what this doctrine is. That's how false doctrine gets started. Um, so as I looked at first Corinthians five, I thought, well, <laughs> he's definitely mentioning individual acts of sin right. in, in chapter five. And even if you take a closer look at chapter six, he's still addressing individual acts of sin, um, right before. So the argument that I had heard is know you not verse 15 of first Corinthians six, know you not that your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. 
Meaning like if you are a Christian and you lay with a whore, that you are joining Christ to that whore. Um, and, and that's where he's saying is like, that's your correction. Well, just in that example in and of itself, laying with a harlot is an individual act of sin. Um, you know, so right there, that's already inaccurate. But I think it needs to be addressed because people um, oftentimes, all too often, when false doctrine is spoken to them, when they hear it via preaching, when somebody's sitting there talking with them, they never go check it out themselves. And Heather, the thing about false, false doctrine and false teaching is because we live in a biblical illiterate society today, um, what, what's happening to Christians is they're, they're just blindsided, man. I mean, if you don't know the word, you know, and uh, there's, a big, there's a serious problem there. You know, the, the thing about it is the Holy Spirit uh, will guard you as long as you have a hunger for the truth ladies and gentlemen the Holy Spirit will guard you and, and lead you and guide you into all truth Amen. and um, I'm gonna tell you he's gonna lead you to the cross is where he's gonna lead you uh, there is no other place and um, the Apostle Paul here he says it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. So right here, the Apostle Paul, now understand that this was, this was the church that Paul established, the church at Corinth. And understand today that he is speaking to believers. This is the number one thing that I see that refutes their claims, that we don't see our side of depravity. Paul is dealing with fornication right here in the believer's life. So understand right there, listen, we're still in a fallen body. And I think that one of the things that they try to refute is the fact that, well, we don't look at that part of us. We don't want to see that, that part of us that's fallen. Well, that's a, that's a direct de uh, rejection of the cross right there. Because the cross, when it's proclaimed properly, it should always reveal the wickedness of a man's heart. Right. That way man can receive the grace of God. There is no other way to receive the grace of God other than seeing the, the, the worthlessness of self, number one, and then receiving that grace to give you strength in your daily life, in your walk with Christ. So right here, we see him dealing with fornication in the church. Now, it's not um, so much as these teachers, Heather, they say, well, um, we have, I, I noticed the term complete forgiveness is used a lot of times. Right. And that's right. We are completely forgiven. But at the same time, you see how much truth this thing uses. But at the same time, I realize that in my life, when the Holy Spirit shows me something as a believer, as a believer, ladies and gentlemen, when he shows me something and my heart is convicted of a certain sin, Maybe I said something to my wife that I needed to apologize for. Maybe you fill in the blank, whatever it is that ails us. Understand, I, I have to repent of that. I have to confess that sin. There's, there's only one way to deal with sin. It has to be dealt with, number one, at the cross. That was where redemption was won. That was where sin was paid for. So when I have a sin in my life that I know is not pleasing to my Lord and he shows me that, then I am to go back to the cross of Christ and say, Lord, please forgive me of that. And the Bible claims that he is faithful and just to do so. You know, but something that they, there's a few things you said here, something that they, they like to make excuse. The thing about this is, any time that somebody brings up something that sounds good to your ears and it sounds like a new thing that you've never heard before, it's very important that when you sit down in the Word and you take those things before the Lord first that you do. It's very important that you do that. Not only that, that you don't read the Word of God in mind of what you are wanting to see, but rather with the humbled spirit of, Lord, I don't know what truth is. I need you to show me what the truth is, not a right. truth, not a fact. Um, there's a fact that you're wearing a bright orange shirt today. Right. That's not what I would consider truth. Mm -hmm. The word of God is truth. Okay, so we're not looking for some fact. The thing I've noticed with hyper grace, with listening to uh, Paul White, with listening to Steve Tanton, 
Um, and I haven't listened to Joseph Prince, so I can't talk about what he preaches. I really don't know. But these two I've heard avidly. And one thing I've noticed is they're real good at, at um, explaining away why it is they believe what they believe, and yet those things are inaccurate. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they would make an argument like if you would say what you said, he's addressing an individual act of sin as fornication, he's addressing the church, he's addressing believers, then their argument would be, and I've listened to them long enough to to know what their argument probably would be, is, well, not everybody in a church but is Heather, saved or unsaved. Listen, in order for them to be able to explain and teach this mess, they have to put, they have to pick out the scriptures they want to. Of course, they're only because seeing what they want to. We're we're refuting it right here. What I, what my point is is you can't just like my husband's message last night. He preached a message about casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and the knowledge of God being the cross of Christ That's and right. what He has yeah. done. Um, so we can't do this with human reasoning. That imaginations means reasoning. Um, and what they're doing is they're trying to explain away their error by human reasoning. Therefore, people will accept it because they know most people don't sit down in their word and go before God and say, you show me this is true, Lord. And that's where people are, are being duped into believing a lie, thinking that it's truth. Yeah. You know, Heather, let's go over there and look at those scriptures because... Which ones? Uh, where Paul would use that phrase. 2 Corinthians second, 10. 2 Corinthians 10. And, um, you know, Paul begins out saying in verse 3, For we walk, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. Mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, Heather, if I'm a hyper grace teacher, I don't even cover this. I, I don't even go this way. I'm going to. Why wouldn't I, you? I'm going to avoid this way. Why? Because we're talking about spiritual warfare. And why would you avoid that if you and were a hyper grace teacher? Spiritual warfare is offensive to them. Why? Because they're perfect. How? <laughs> do you see? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Oh, I do completely. Now let's look at the the part to where he gets. He says, "Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God." Now, right there, anything, ladies and gentlemen, that exalts itself above the message of the cross is a false teaching, and it is it is being led by a seducing spirit and a doctrine of devils. That's what 2 Timothy chapter 4 proclaims. It's a seducing spirit. Anytime false doctrine enters in, it has to come with another spirit because all God's works are done in the truth. Right. We understand that. So anytime there's error, God's not in error. He doesn't work in error. He can't legally work in error because our God is holy, just, right, faithful, true, and, and you fill in all the rest of the blanks there. But understand right here, he's saying anything that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. As we just mentioned, the knowledge of God is the wisdom that is in the cross. That Listen, God doesn't go any further as it regards uh, believers. As it regards his redemption plan, he doesn't go any further than the cross. That's why Paul said we preach Christ crucified. We don't deviate from that. That's why he told them, I don't want to know anything else among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So right here, if you're going to take a scripture and, well, let's just look at all the, the, the scriptures. I've got two pages of literally scriptures that, that point out the believer's total depravity right here in the study guide. So when we look at these scriptures, you have to skip over those if you're a hyper grace teacher. Well, and, and if they don't skip over them, um, if they were brought, if it were brought up to them, again, they would twist it and say, well, that's talking about an unbeliever. That was talking about my unsaved state. Because remember, what they believe is that um, almost an unconditional eternal security. They, they pretty much, they, they wouldn't all say that. If you sat them down and you said, do you believe in unconditional eternal security? Some of them might say, no, I don't believe that once saved, always saved. But what they're saying is 
They're basically saying that's yes. Really, they won't say that to, you, to your, your face, face, but that's what they but, teach. But that's what they're really teaching. So if you're only talking about a once saved, always saved, and a once benefit, always benefits, and you're only looking at the good stuff and not depravity and such, then you would have to ignore your current state. Meaning you would have to, you would have to say, well, you can't look at, uh, then you're denying the fact that you have a continual daily walk with the Lord. Yeah. You would have to deny that there are trials. Just the scripture you, you brought up just a minute ago talks about warfare. You're right. You won't hear them talk about that because that would sound seemingly negative like there's a struggle. And there is a struggle to fight for this faith. We don't have to fight the devil. He was defeated at the cross. Um, but the, the struggle to, to keep that faith. I think that they would say that we're under law right now is, what, is one of the things that they would say is they would suggest that we're under law because uh, we're, we're trying to put make confession of work or we're trying to, you know, they would say certain things. Well, let me change the word. Let me change the wording then. Now, the Bible actually says confession. Confess your faults one to another. But let's just change the word to acknowledge. Let's acknowledge that sin before the Lord. There's How do you, how do you make that a work? I mean, you're just... You can, to acknowledge, yes, Lord, I messed up. I need your grace. That's the very meaning of, of that's the very, the very need for grace, to acknowledge that you have a need for it. You know, Heather, the, uh, I mentioned yesterday, I believe it was a couple of times, and I, I, somewhere in my messages yesterday, I mentioned uh, about he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Mm -hmm. So what do we do when Jesus spoke those words in the book of Revelation? He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. What do they do with Jude when Jude told us to earnestly contend for this faith? What do they do with Paul when Paul said, fight the good fight of faith? Um, th those are the, some of the scriptures that they're going to bypass in their teaching. They ignore it. Listen, yeah. if it doesn't agree with what Christ did on the cross of Calvary, you can't use it. Amen. Are, are you with me this Amen. morning? You can't you can't pick and choose what scriptures you desire to choose on. And and if I could set one of them down right now and just say, look, have you looked at this? Have you seen this? How do you refer that to your teaching now? They would be uh, more than likely not know how to answer a question like or that. Or they would again try to say that you're speaking about an, a non-believer or. That's the Something. only they thing that they can do. They, they, they would they're have trying, to twist They're it. having to change and, and let, you know, the whole role should agree. From the cover of Genesis to the last amen of Revelation, it should all agree. And it should all appoint to one thing. Listen, we understand our translations aren't exactly perfect. You understand? But we have a solid... Uh, word of God that God has kept his hand on over the years and I know that you can't tell me you can't tell me it's like the the first John chapter 1 thing where they uh, exclude that that was written to a, a believer you know what I'm saying I mean it's it's something else I've seen them do is they'll take the meaning of a word they'll take a word and they'll try to twist what the meaning is so if the word is confess they'll say that it's not to talk about your sin confess means to speak the same message as though they're speaking the same message we are you know heather they're um, op they're operating in gnosticism whether they want to admit it or not yeah they're using their human reasoning and knowledge claiming to have a greater knowledge uh of god i've heard the statement made by one of these individuals that they want to walk in the fullness of what christ did when you get now, your glorified body, you will. Now, <laughs> my argument to that is, well, we are. We, we absolutely are. But we're not skipping over parts of the scriptures um, to do that. We're, we're, we're taking the whole, the, whole uh, the whole role that Paul taught as it regards. Well, we just don't want to focus on that part of us. Is, is I, I think that you could just hear that echo that's some of the thought. We don't want to focus on our depravity. We, we want to focus on the fullness of the finished work. Well, we are. But you can't leave out 
depravity. It is such an important doctrine that the Apostle Paul would, would introduce to the believer in systematic order. He would introduce that doctrine before he even gave you justification by faith, sanctification by faith, regeneration, all the things and how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. And, and you can go all through the book of Romans, which is written in that systematic order. Paul introduced depravity first mm -hmm. because we still live in a fallen body. You're not ever going to get around that fact. That's right. That's right. So... Absolutely so. You know, again, the, the redefinition of what some of those words mean. I've heard taught that when sin, the word sin is used, and I'm talking about the verb, not the, the noun, not the verb meaning the individual acts of sin. I've heard people state in this hyper grace error that um, that word, sin is not talking about individual acts of sin they'll say they'll argue that it's meaning um that god's definition of sin is not fornication or adultery lying backbiting that it's not these individual acts of sin that what's displeasing to god is not believing the finished work see how it's twisted well yeah but heather they say their argument is is this with that they say well because I understand my position better than you do, it causes me to sin less. You, you say I hear you. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear what they're saying with that, but that if if I'm not willing for God to correct me, okay? If number I'm, number if, one, that's a, that's a lie. If Because only your faith in the cross of Calvary is going to cause you to sin less. If right. you don't believe that you have individual acts of sin and that God corrects you based on those, then for them to say, it causes me to sin less, does it? Or do you just not look at your sin anymore? Yeah, well, have you accepted it like and said, brushed it under the rug? You're sweeping it under the rug, and that's, because, that's because dangerous. Then they say, well, your, your, act, your position, your, your focus... And no, knowledge of your position in Christ is what keeps you from sinning. So if my focus stays continually there, just playing the devil's advocate, does that mean that I'm going to be sinlessly perfect? Or maybe that I already am and I just don't know it? You know, Heather... Do the, you see but, how deceptive this is? Right. And once again, their, their argument is uh, it's, it causes me to sin less when I focus on the the fullness of the finished work and listen identification with christ ladies and gentlemen is a beautiful thing it is it's a beautiful doctrine that i think every believer needs to understand we embrace that we teach that here we we believe that here because we know that uh and we understand that that the uh the the repositioning of of the of the born again believer moves from old Adam into Christ Jesus. You can't right. you can't get around that, and we understand the fullness of that uh, of our in Christ position. We don't live in the body of Adam anymore. That body was crucified, and now we have been raised up a new man in Christ. So, understanding our position. Just it, it, it helps us. It, it helps us understand justification. That's right. How God was able to justify us legally. It helps us understand the sanctification uh, process. Now, here's where they twist identification with Christ. Whenever we are injected into the body of Christ, um, the man is still in a fallen body, even though in the mind of God it's settled. Are you with me? Right. In the mind of God, it's settled, but we're still here in this present time in a fallen body, and we have a heavenly Father, according to Hebrews chapter 12, that corrects us. If we're not being corrected um, in progress, I'm, I'm speaking of progressive sanctification. If we're not being corrected there, and, and I tell you, let's just go over there. We need to we need to cover those scriptures. Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 12. And let's look in, in verse 6. It says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chastiseth, and scourgeth every son. Now, 
this totally just refutes their, their lie right here. For whom the Lord loveth, he chastiseth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So, in other words, and I've heard the comment made, Heather, God does not correct us for sin. God corrects us based on our position. I've, I've heard That's that. That's what we started out talking about. I've heard that statement made. I have too. But right here, obviously the scripture says that if you don't have the if you don't have a God that loves you and is scourging you, excuse me, let me say it like this. If you don't have a God that corrects you, you don't have a God that loves you. Well, how are, they, are you with me? How they get around it is they take a word like chastening and they look up the definition and they find, you know, like love. There's agape love, there's phileo love, there's five different types of love in the Greek. They'll pick the one that best suits their um, their their argument. So for chastening, they'll say, well, that just means to teach. I have the word underlined here or circled here in verse 7, if. Just that little word if right there. Now, let's look at what it says. If you endure chastening. Now, you have to ask the question right now. Are you enduring chastening? You'll know it when the Lord's chastening you. When he's correcting when, when, you. When God's correcting you, a believer will know. There's no doubt. There's no question. If, though, you have to answer the question, if, then God dealeth with you how? As sons. For what son is he of whom the Father chasteneth not? That's so clear. The Lord corrects us. Have you ever seen, have you ever been in the store, and I know everybody has, been in the store and watched a kid throw an arched back screaming fit over their parent not buying them a pack of gum or a uh -huh. piece of candy Yeah. in Walmart? Have you ever seen that? I know I have, and when I've seen that, I've thought, man, if you don't get a hold of that child and correct that child and that behavior now, you're going to be crying when they're in jail and somebody else is correcting them. Mm -hmm. um, you either correct them now or somebody else, is, they're going to be in jail. They're going to be, you can't let them run wild. And what he is saying in Hebrews 12 is he is talking about the natural things so we can understand the spiritual things. Us as parents, we would not want Nathan to run wild and just act a fool and, and however he wants because that would mean we don't love him. Right. So if I'm in the store and my kid's acting a fool and I'm not correcting him, he's a bastard. He's right. not my kid. See, somebody else's kid can be acting a fool in Walmart. I'm not going to walk up and spank their kid much as I might want to. I'm not going to spank their kid because that's not my kid. Right. But my kid, I would correct him. Not always with spanking, but, you know, when um, you're, when you're, when to you're make a point. When you're rebuked of the Lord, um, you know, that's a great feeling to me. <laughs> well, are you a glutton for punishment then? No, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> simply stating a fact, though. You guys follow what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Uh, when you're rebuked and corrected of the Lord, when I read through here, that brings me comfort because it lets me realize I'm a child of God. I'm a son of God. And my father is correcting me. Now, he goes on to say, but if you be without... Sorry. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. Wait, listen, this doctrine that they're teaching is creating a bastard church, if I can say it that way. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but if you if you reject the correction of the Lord, man, you're moving in a wrong direction. And you're working outside of the truth and you're being led by another spirit out there and another Jesus, Paul would teach us. So we need to understand, would you guys agree with what I'm, what I'm saying here? I mean... This is this is really uh, this is really the 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 thing that can shut them down right here it is Hebrews chapter twelve because if I'm correct Heather uh, they mostly teach that God does not correct us not based on individual acts of sin they won't say I've heard people teach that he he they, he will correct us 
but he's going to correct us about our object of faith and not about individual acts of sin. So then, therefore, sin would have to be redefined as not believing the finished work of Christ and not individual acts of sin. Do you see what I'm saying? How the, sure. the twisting yeah. and contorting. And when you use a word like seducing spirits, you know, um, when you think of the word seduction, you can you could see a commercial on prime time and see seduction in the uh, Victoria, you know, secrets commercial. That's what it is. It's something that's pleasing to the eye. It's something that draws you into a place that you don't need to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, just because it's not that obvious doesn't mean it's not seductive. And it doesn't mean that it's not evil. And what we're saying is, you know, you can't just listen to what people are preaching. You have got to, got to, got to sit down see it for yourself and say, God, if that is right, you show me and be willing for him to show you that your mindset is wrong. I'm going to, I'm going to get a little deeper here. Go ahead. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to do the best I can to cut to the root of this thing. So whenever, whenever we talk about position and identity with Christ, um, they say we're perfect and that God sees us perfect. Okay. Positionally, positionally, that's correct. Positionally, they say, well, we're moved over here into the body of Christ now. And, and there's positionally, that positionally, is correct. positionally, God does see us there. Okay. We've taught as, that. as, in, as it is in Christ, but to, to disannul and disregard the fact that the painful fact of sin when I, as a believer, screw up. And it's not when you do, or it's not if you do, it's when you do. I'm going to mess up as a believer from time to time. They're having to, having to ignore that. Can I bring an example to the do table? Do you see what I'm saying? They're having to ignore the, the, the painful fact that we're still in a fallen body until the trump sounds. Why not just say, hey... I am still in a fallen body. I still have a need to confess and repent. Why not say that? What if, okay, the night that I had our daughter, had her at home mm -hmm. with midwives. Um, after I had her, I hemorrhaged. I was bleeding to death. And there wasn't anything they could do for me. Now, what if in that moment we had said, oh, well, we're not in a fallen body oh, well, let's just not look at this situation, period. What would have happened? Well, then you move into word of faith. So, but instead we realized our helplessness in the situation and we trusted God. My husband, not to give him glory, but he laid hands on my stomach and he prayed for me. And I, I can't say it was this awesome prayer full of faith. He was terrified. We both were. And God healed me that night. But they're they're moving we didn't, into. But what they're doing the same thing. I know that that's a radical example, but they're basically doing the same thing. Um, and it is word of faith in that in that effect, in the fact that let's just ignore our current condition and the current situation and the problem at hand, because um, let's face it, examples like that. If we weren't living in a fallen body, I never would have bled to death that night. You know. My, um, Brother Mike, if I can ask you this question, I know that you were, you had briefly told me that you used to be in a Word of Faith church. Yes, yes I was. Can you tell us a little bit about what they believe, the Word of Faith there? The Word of Faith, uh, just hearing what you guys say about <coughs> this movement, and I knew a little bit about this, but I told you guys a few years ago, mm -hmm. what I encountered with it. Um, the Word of Faith, if you look back at the history of it, it goes back from uh, the 1800s, it actually wasn't Christian. It wasn't in Christianity. Oh, right. wow. There was a guy named Quimby, and I forgot his first name. He started the New Thought, uh, it was the New Thought Metaphysics. Uh -huh. uh, matter of fact, uh, Christian Science came from that. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, what's her name? Mary Baker Eddy and E.W. Kenyon right. yeah, mm -hmm. read his books. Uh, they had a school in, I think, in Boston called Emerson College. He was fascinated with the new thought. So a lot, and I looked one time, because at church I was going to do a message on that. The pastor mm -hmm. wanted me to do something. I felt in my spirit to do something about word of faith. And I checked 
the guy Quimby. Mm -hmm. I wasn't even gonna check Kenyon. I want to know who started the founder. Who started the whole thing? Mm -hmm. I looked on uh, the internet, and this wasn't for or against. They're just saying who Quimby was. Mm -hmm. They said a lot of Christianity and uh, Christianity and motivational speaking and all that was from this guy. That's what the person who said who Quimby was, Oprah Winfrey. Uh, you name all your motivational speakers right, and the some Christianity. The guy said was influenced by this man. He was an occultist. Wow. He was in the witchcraft. He Come did on. all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So Kenyon decided he liked the stuff he was hearing. And it's mind over matter. Metaphysics, met metaphysical thinking is just mind over matter, almost like Star Wars. Right. You know. Explain. So, Explain. so you know what I'm it's saying? Yeah. You know, it's not there. You know, every, it's not a reality, just like Christian science. Well, basically, that's what Word of Faith. If you look at Word of Faith, and Christian science is very similar because it all came from that man. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I'm listening to you guys talking about this thing, and I didn't check as much as you guys did, but what I'm hearing is the same. The same the lie, the, yeah, It's the lie of the serpent. Right. Yeah. You shall be as God. And see, when they, when they say this, um, you know, it's like my wife used that analogy of our daughter passing away. Um, or, or, you know, the, the thing about it is, uh, if you're in word of faith, they'll tell you correct. Am I correct? But they'll tell you, well, you didn't have enough faith then. Yeah, that's, and that's what I'm saying with this. They're using, when I was going to word of faith church, is it was about health mm -hmm. and money. Mm -hmm. Well, after a while, people were dying, even the churches I went to. They would tell the brother, you know, yeah, your wife is dying, but just keep, I've heard people keep give testimonies it. of, you know, different uh, relatives dying and just hang in there and they would die. So after a while, they quit talking about health because it wasn't working. Right. You know, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. I've heard so many stories That's of sad. bad stories of people doing what they, you know, you can, there's millions of stories of testimonies right. how they didn't work. Right. So now it's about money. Mm -hmm. But I, what I'm seeing with this, now they're doing it with, our, with uh, sin, with the sin nature. They're saying there's not one. Just pretend it's not there. Now, I believe some want to hold on to whatever they're their addictions and stuff, and, they, and that makes them feel relieved. Hey, I don't, but I think some are thinking if I ignore right. my addictions. Let me ask you something, because I've, I've studied some on the word of Pick faith, and, um, you know, there's this part that I've read about. Um, I had a book that I had read, and I'm sure I heard it on Francis and Friends about Deceived on Purpose. Yeah, I, I talking I about that. Rick Warren, and he's in that Word of Faith venue. Yeah. And a lot of what they teach, you said that they would be as gods. Yeah. They believe that um, they can uh, call heaven down, right. so to speak. Right. They can make things happen here in the natural, in the here and now that are in the heavenlies exactly. they can so this metaphysical type of that's basically what they're doing that's in hyper grace is they're saying, saying like. they're saying we can we can call see i never realized that till you said that yeah. there's that's spiritual wickedness in high places folks that's that's trying to that's blasphemy because what you're doing is you are making yourself equal God. with god you're that's making yourself a god right. And, um, you know, when you start getting into that, that is witchcraft and sorcery yes, of the worst kind. The devil is always trying to promote himself, and he's always trying to find a, a vessel he can use um, for his sorcery and his witchcraft. So, you know, the, the thing about it is, going back to the analogy there, um, how can you just say, well, I'm ignoring the fact that my daughter wasn't healed uh, it's and it was because i didn't have enough faith you know really you you crush a believer when you would you would tell would, when you would tell them such a thing you didn't have enough faith so in order for these hyper grace teachers and hang on i'm going somewhere okay in order for these hyper grace teachers to look over the to to look over the imperfect to ignore it to ignore imperfectness to ignore reality is what they are really doing. They're ignoring reality. Right. Reality is right now we still live in a fallen body. They say no, we're not. Now they once again they won't tell you that to your face. No. It, but they in, in not so many words. What what is happening is is 
that deception is is creeping in and it it and it stems from that word of faith i'll give you a it, good example yeah Go brother copeland well kim i don't want to say I'm, yeah kim copeland <laughs> said that you know who the biggest liar was right God. right you know why you know why he you never heard it because he never said he was so that's what i'm saying with this i can say i don't say i got a drinking problem or a gambling problem Therefore, I don't have it. I don't it. have it. It's new thought. Right. It's part of it's the Gnosticism. metaphysical Gnosticism. Basically, that's all it is. But it's, it's, it's twisting, and it's evil, and it's cunning. Christian because... science don't believe in saying you're sick. See, it all is the same spirit, the same demon. Right. It actually, it, it, it's you not know. Christianity. No. That's why we're saying, ladies and gentlemen, here this morning, that, that all false doctrine comes with another spirit because God can't work in error. And yeah, I, I know how that strikes people when we say that, but it is the truth. God cannot and will not work in any era whatsoever. If it's got a little leaven in it, you can count God out. God's not in that. God can only work in the truth. And the, the Holy Spirit's job is to lead us and guide us into all truth. Once God is trying to show us uh, error, okay, Here's the thing. According to what we've just studied here in Hebrews 12, these scriptures I have read about correction. Does the Holy Spirit not correct us and try to get us out of false error, out of false doctrine too? Absolutely. So if you're avoiding God's correction, then you're avoiding the Holy Spirit, which is trying to lead you into all truth. Are you with me? The difficult thing about this error and why I believe that it is so incredibly wicked and such an attack on the true message of the cross and the true grace of God, not a fake false grace like a pseudo grace that they are presenting, um, is that there's so much truth to what they say. We have taught and teach about when we're talking about identification with Christ, you were taken out of the old Adam and you were in the mind of God placed into Christ. And scripture bears out that we are the body of Christ. You, I, Brother Warfield, we are the body of Christ. And uh, one might be the ear, one might be the hands. Um, mm -hmm. Those things is truth. And so when we're, what we're saying is not that identification with Christ is wrong. We're not saying that. The thing that I hate about this doctrine and when we're trying to break it down is it causes confusion. So the important thing, you know, I, I don't think there's any confusion. I, I think people, understand. I think there's a lot of people that are confused. Well, I, I think that people understand what we're, what we're trying to say is my, my point was this second Corinthians four and 16 talks about how our outward man perishes mm -hmm. but the inward man is renewed day by day there's the reality of it yeah we live in a fallen body uh the inward man that is renewed day by day we're being renewed and reminded of what it is christ has done uh right. on a day by day basis but to say that we are not that the outward man is not perishing is not realistic the difference ladies and gentlemen between us and them is that we teach progressive sanctification as a believer and that is in your bible it's all over the place you can't you can't you should even know it by personal experience ladies and gentlemen if you're truly born again you should know it by personal experience there's a continual work there's happening. a continual work going on in your life um once again i remember mentioning yesterday I know that there's a progressive work going on. When I first got saved, when I first got born again, I went through, you know, this little what I call honeymoon stage with God, but then the bottom fell out of my life. And I didn't know what was going on, but I knew God was in control of it because things were really upside down. All I'm saying is, is God wants us to see the worthlessness of self in this life. Otherwise, we're not even going to appreciate heaven. We're not even going to appreciate what he did on the cross of Calvary. Um, are you with me? You know, Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that's speaking to believers, by the mercies of God, that's the grace of God, right? Um, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. 
That speaks of walking in the death of Christ mm -hmm. daily. Um, and be not conformed to the this world, but be ye transformed. That word transformed is metamorpho, which speaks of a... Um, a process like a larva to a butterfly um, by the renewing of your mind right that you may prove what is good and acceptable perfect will of God all speaking of what Christ has done at the cross this speaks of a transition it speaks of um, a continual work a forming so to speak uh, Philippians 1 and 6, he which hath begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. There's a that's, past, that's present, so future. That's so clear right there. I've sought the Lord because it bothered me when I followed Paul White six to eight years ago and he didn't teach this. I took this before the Lord knowing that JSM did teach it. And these were the only ones I really listened to back then. And um, so I sought the Lord and I said, Lord, I need you to show me if progressive sanctification is true and it's in your word, I want you to show me. And he not only showed me, of course, in life experiences, he showed me in scripture. Um, if you continue in my word, you shall be my disciples. Mm -hmm. There's uh, he that endures until the end. Yep. Those all speak of, of it not being a once and for all thing that happened when I got saved, but a but continual Heather, work Heather, there, there's, occurring. There's, there's a whole lot more of course there is. we could give as it regards progress. I'm just giving a few. Um, so once again, the difference between us and them, and I want the people to, to be cleared up on this, okay. is that there is a progressive work going on in every believer's life. For us to deny that is to deny part of the gospel, and which is extremely dangerous. When you go to, to denying the progressive work that God does, listen, he gave the comforter on the day of Pentecost when the comforter was poured out on 120 individuals in the upper room. Whenever that was done, that was done for a purpose. So the Holy Spirit could begin the forming process in our life, the conforming process, if you will. As Heather just mentioned, the word transformed, the conforming process. We are to be changed in to the image of Christ, the scripture says. So we're not there. We have not arrived, neither will we until the trump sounds. So to, to put yourself in a position to where you're already past the trumpet sounding is error. And that is the difference between us and them. The difference is they're removing part of the gospel. We're not. You understand? So, Amen. I mean, I think we're, where are we at on time? I think we're getting about out of time today. And uh, we're getting to the end of the broadcast here. And I... I I hope, ladies and gentlemen, we've said something that um, has uh, helped you once again to recognize this era that is going on in the modern church. And and I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, I, I, I see this spreading. Do you all agree? Oh, yes. Big time. I, I, I see this thing because it is so, it looks so good to the flesh. It's seductive. Anything that looks good to the flesh, that ought to be a red flag. You understand? That ought to be a red flag. If it looks good, if it makes you feel good, if it makes you feel comfortable in your sin, that should be a red flag. And that's what this doctrine, this error does. It'll make you feel comfortable in your sin. It eventually lead to antinomianism where you have no regard for righteousness whatsoever. Something I heard Brother Lauren Larson say recently is he said, this thing goes temporal real quick. Meaning, um, you know, when it f has you focus on your best life now, uh, there's something wrong with that. Not that we're not to enjoy life while we're here, but, um, you know, if the trump sounded and the rapture happened today, man, I want to see this kid's face that's in my stomach right now. But there's nothing holding me here. I love my family. I, I, I want to see this kid, but the truth is there's nothing here that uh, holds anything for me. I would right. rather be with Jesus. Right. Um, and if the rapture happened today, if it would mess your life up, um, that's a good spirit check. That's a good uh, way for us to know, am I, check, yes. am I focused on today and the cares of this life? And, anything, and I think this doctrine 
causes people to focus on this life now, just as Joel's new book, right. you know, uh, is so deceptive. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, we shouldn't be as focused on that. Exactly. We, um, you know, hopefully we've said something today, ladies and gentlemen, that's helped you. Uh, we want to continue to make... Um, this new DVD set available to you, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, for those of you in Radio Land, I'm holding up our newest DVD set. Uh, for any donation to the ministry, we will send this to you. It has uh, four DVDs inside of it that uh, were taken from the Following the Way of the Cross broadcast. It's on and, our website. Uh, it's on our website now. Um, there's also other DVDs there available. Get the Danger of False Teaching. All of these will help you get the study guides. All of these will help you um, be less likely to be one that is taken under by this error. And um, I'm here to tell you if it looks good, once again, if it looks good, feels good, sounds good to the flesh, it's probably not it's God. It's probably not God. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Uh, because God just simply doesn't work that way. He, he has his own plan he already devised in eternity past, and uh, we have to go his way or it's no way. So Amen. praise God. And um, camp meeting is this weekend. Woohoo! And uh, we're looking forward to it. Uh, Friday night, we're going to have Pastor Scott Hammond here, and he will be kicking off the camp meeting. And uh, we will have uh, Minister Luke Pogue the next Saturday morning at 10 a.m. That is all Central Standard Time. These services uh, will be streamed live, so you can watch them live if you weren't able to make it down here. Um, Minister Luke Pogue, once again, he'll be up at 10 o'clock, and that's CST, Central Standard Time. Then uh, Pastor Curtis Hutchinson will be up um, at 2 p.m. that afternoon. And uh, just after lunch there, uh, he will be up at 2 p.m. And then closing it out for Saturday night will be Pastor Wayne Voss at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. And then Sunday morning again, we've got two services on Sunday. Uh, Pastor Curtis Hutchinson will be back up again at 10 a.m. at our normal church time. And then at 3 p.m., now catch that, that's 3 p.m., uh, we will have Pastor Mark Goldwire here closing out the camp meeting services. And, um, boy, I just can't wait. I'm excited. Amen. We're only four days away from it now, and uh, we're believing that there's going to be a mighty, mighty outpouring of the Spirit of God. Amen. And He is going to move greatly in people's lives. Praise Amen. God. Amen. And uh, so come on out to camp meeting if you can. There's still time. There's Give still the There's still rooms available. The address is 26434 Lexington Road. That address again is 26434 Lexington Road. And that's Spring, Texas. And uh, 77373. And um, we are just about 30 miles north of downtown Houston. And uh, you can come on out and be a part of these great services. We encourage you to do so. So uh, with that, we'll close. And uh, we will be coming back at you tomorrow morning. Whichever way the Lord leads us is the way we'll go. Praise God. Love each and every one of you. God richly bless you all. Bye-bye.